So let's move on then to the introduction of our distinguished speaker tonight. Uh, he, his, uh, his name is Dr. Stephen Kay, and he uh, became the Dean of Biological Sciences at UCSD. Uh, last year I served as an interim dean, and I was one of the happiest people to, to have Steve uh, uh, come and take over my position uh, at the university. And he comes with a very distinguished track record and career. Uh, uh, that, that uh, before he came to UCSD. He's one of the world's experts in an area known as chronobiology, which tries to understand the nuts and bolts of how the biological clocks work. And there are numerous biological clocks that he'll talk about that determine everything from our uh, sleep-wake cycles to when fl uh, flowers develop and, and uh, open up and so on. And these biological clocks then form the Rolex watches uh, that, that make our systems tick. And this, they are common to all organisms. And Steve's contributions have been not only in the discovery of the individual components of these clocks in a variety of systems, from plants to fruit flies to mammals, but what he will tell you is essentially how the, the logic of these circuits makes sense from an evolutionary point of view. As we go through these series of lectures during this year, you will hear a number of people talking about how certain proteins in evolution look the same, that is, they're related to each other, and they perform the same biological function in, in, the, in single cell organisms or in humans. But what I find most interesting in Steve's work is that he's not only identified some of these conserved components, but he is looking at a bigger pattern, bigger picture of how these individual components can be unique in different systems, and yet they come together to perform the same logical circuitry and to provide the same biological output using different parts. So it's as if you're making different kinds of clocks that all do the same timekeeping function using different components in different systems. He has been recognized for his work by numerous awards. Uh, and I'll mention one in particular, three times uh, during his career in the last decade or so, in 1997, 1998, and 2002, his work was free, featured in uh, a science uh, magazine called, called Science as one of the breakthroughs of the year. So most of us in science are fortunate to hit one big breakthrough of the year in our lifetimes, but to have three of them in a period of five years gives you some idea of the wonderful science that he and his colleagues have been doing. Steve got his uh, BS and PhD degrees from the University of Bristol in UK. And then after a short stint at the University of Virginia, he moved to the Scripps Research Institute here in San Diego uh, on, on Torrey Pines Road in 1996. He rose through the ranks here at Scripps to become chair of the Department of Biochemistry and the director of, of the Center for Childhood and Neglected Diseases, focusing on a number of important uh, diseases that affect humans all over the world. He's also worked in pharmaceutical companies as a chief scientific officer of a company called Phenomics and um, comes with a very distinguished career. We're delighted to have him at UCSD. His talk tonight will focus on clockwork genes and the specific subtitle is Biological Rhythms in Health and Agriculture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Steve Kay. I always find with introductions like that, I, I find myself asking, who is Suresh actually introducing? Um, it's, in, it's incredible. And, and in fact, I think one thing that's, that's important to point out is, is how humbling it really is to be um, a scientist. And it's humbling for, for several reasons. Uh, the two that I think are most pertinent tonight are uh, 
Our job is to discover. Our job is to see things in nature that no one has seen before. And that's the demand that is placed on us as scientists. And, second, and I find that just a wondrous thing. It, it makes the hairs stand up on my arm every day when I get up. And the second is that scientists really have to work as networks. And, and it could never be more true that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And, and I'll be bringing that theme up in this talk. But certainly in terms of inheriting this, this great position as Dean of the School of the Biological Sciences, um, having Suresh go before me has, has burnt a path that, that makes it much easier for me to follow. Who actually are we? What is a division of biological sciences before we turn to our topic tonight? Uh, what I just want to tell you is this fantastic partnership that we have with the Natural History Museum in terms of, of helping to educate the public on, on scientific issues is, is driven really by the faculty, staff, and students of this division. We have about 80 faculty that are split into four sections or departments. We, we teach many thousands of students. A quarter of UCSD students declare a major in biology, about 5,000 students currently. And, and we're very proud of, of merging our mission of, of research and education together. And in fact, we cover a very broad swath. Let's face it, this is the age of biology. Biology touches all of our lives, be it in health, the economy, or the environment. And so scientists amongst this four sections, one of them actually, one of our faculty members, Walter Yetz, will be giving a talk here in the biodiversity, on biodiversity and the climate change. But we have other scientists tackling some of the world's health problems in terms of global health, looking at biofuels that has an effect on the global economy, and also looking at, at the function of the brain and diseases such as Alzheimer's. And so I, I really am a, a big believer in the fact that, that biology and a knowledge of biology being used to drive public policy really will save the world through contributions to improving global health, making a stronger global economy, and, and a cleaner global environment. Now, I don't want to disappoint you all or to feel that there might be a, some bait and switch occurring, but I am myself not an evolutionary biologist. What I am is a scientist who needs to put into the context of evolution the discoveries we make because it's in that context that helps us understand how these beautiful mechanisms of development, behavior, and physiology that we observe in all organisms have arrived at where they are and how we can be informed by the evolutionary relationships amongst organisms. The other speakers who are coming after me really are people who look at the mechanisms of evolution and I urge you to come to their talks. Bill McGuinness will be telling you about embryos and evolution, how these master development genes are regulated. Marty Yanofsky, who will be telling us about how flower formation in the plant kingdom is conserved amongst different types of plants. Chris Wills, who will be telling us about the evolution of complexity. And finally, ending up in April with Ajit Varki, who will be telling us about the genetics of primate evolution. We just simply cannot do these types of events. We need partnerships between the private sector, between universities and places like the museum, which enable us then to mount these types of educational campaigns as, as a partnership. And I'm very grateful to Amelin and Kieran and the other types of people who participate from the biopharma sector in, in research and education. My own journey tonight um, is, is, is uh, a somewhat long, long one, and it might inform you a little bit of my own interest in science. Um, I grew up on the island of Jersey, and uh, Jersey is a, is a small island uh, in between England and France in the English Channel. And uh, it's only 11 miles by five. And so I grew up for 17 years on this island and basically got a love of biology from the amazing oceans. Skipping my education in the UK and New York and Virginia, um, 11 years ago, my wife and I moved here um, to this fantastic city, San Diego, where really I, I began to, to really become interested in the Torrey Pines Mesa and the incredible institutions that we have and a, few, and a few months ago, I, I arrived at the San Diego campus. And of course, that brings us tonight through a little bit of traffic and some parking <laughs> to, uh, to Balboa Park, where we all are here in, in this building um, tonight.
to really start thinking about biological complexity and, and how mechanisms of biological complexity have evolved from simple organisms into modern ones. And I just heard on my earpiece that the person who's illegally parked just here, uh, you might need to get up and move your vehicle, apparently. So the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. Um, we think that s some of the earliest life forms, the archaebacteria, started to appear about 3.5 billion years ago. Multicellular life forms about 600 million years ago, and, and it goes on through there to the present day. And as all of you know, of course, if, if, if the life history of the planet were a 12-hour clock, it would only be in the last one hundredth of a second that man finally appeared. So this is an old planet and it has a great story to tell. And one of the stories that it will tell you is that for most of its life, this planet has spun on its axis and circled around the sun. And that spinning on its axis and circling around the sun means that most life on this planet, with the exception of cave organisms and, and, and very deep sea creatures, things like that, most life on this planet has evolved under cycles of light and darkness. So it's therefore fairly intuitive to think that organisms will have developed biological rhythms to organize their behavior, their physiology, their metabolism, so that they will adapt better to, a, a, to cycles of light and darkness. And of course, this will be the case, for example, in all early mammals. It's thought that all early mammals, for example, were nocturnal. And obviously, one of the reasons for that is to avoid predation by the, the end of the great dinosaur area and the small overlap there was between them. One can take advantage of organizing your behavior with respect to light-dark cycles to get an adaptive advantage. But if we're sort of thinking heuristically about how then do we build a clock, how do we allow organisms to be diurnal or nocturnal in their behavior, for example, one might imagine that it would be simple to build sand timers inside of organisms. These sand timers would be set off by dawn or dusk. They would do a biological countdown. And any type of physiological reaction or biochemical reaction could be read out from that sand timer. And thus, you would be able to heuristically organize behavior and physiology with respect to light and dark. But that mechanism breaks down under a particular challenge. And what that challenge is, is the fact that the Earth tilts on its axis relative to the sun throughout the year. And the consequence of that then is that day and night length in most clines of the planet change in length. With that happening, what that means is as a simple time, uh, sand timer mechanism would no longer then be sufficient to appropriately time reactions. And I think, heuristically, it's for that reasons that organisms have evolved real clocks, real oscillators, and they use these oscillators to time very important biological events. Now, of course, we as humans know how these day-night cycles impact us, and the advent, of course, of transmeridian travel, jet lag, and of course, the, uh, the invention of the electric light bulb has really challenged our circadian organization, our 24-hour organization as humans. Here you can see in this beautiful picture that was shot by a, a shuttle astronaut, you can see it's a very rare, clear day um, in, in, uh, in Western Europe. And you can see over in France here already, they're turning the lights on, they're strolling the boulevards of Paris. Well, over here in England, what the Brits have realized is that for a change, it's a beautiful day, and they've all left work early to go to the pub. <laughs> However you want to look at it, light-dark cycles have a phenomenal effect on us as humans, and the advent of electric lights and the ability to, to move transmeridian has had a big impact on how we organize ourselves. Biological clocks occur in all organisms. And so what we're going to be talking about tonight is a little bit of comparative physiology, a little bit of comparative genome science. And one person who often will crop up as we talk about this, of course, is Charles Darwin. And as you'll la hear later in this talk, he actually studied circadian rhythms, particularly in plants, and made some of the most fundamental discoveries um, uh, in terms of thinking about how clocks are organized.
So given that rhythms occur in, in many organisms, what a scientist then would like to ask is, what is the relationship between these 24-hour rhythms that you can see amongst different organisms? And when we start thinking and rationalizing about that, we can go out to nature and say, well, what we see in insects is, is their locomotor activity, how they fly around or when they emerge from their pupil cases is regulated by a 24-hour clock. In plants, we'll be able to, we're going to see about leaf movements and, and photosynthetic capacity that cycles dramatically in the plant kingdom. And when it comes to humans, of course, the uh, rhythm that we're most aware of is our sleep-wake cycle. There's also a rhythm in cognition, by the way, in, in your ability to perform tests. And it actually dips right around 6 p.m. So if you actually find yourself having trouble listening to my talk, I don't feel bad, okay? It's not my, it's not my problem, it's your clock's problem. Um, so all of these rhythms, how do they relate to each other? And of course, the way in which biologists start to look at taxonomic groups of organisms and ask questions about how certain functions are performed or how morphology occurs in those different taxonomic groups is, is really to do with the construction of what's been loosely termed as trees of life. And this amazing picture that Darwin drew after he had come from the Beagle and he was sitting down writing his transmutation notebooks. And this is from page 36 of Transmutation Notebook B. This is in 1837, a year after he was off the Beagle and before his major essays that he wrote in 1842 and 1844. He simply wrote at the top of the page, I think. And then what he sketched was something that, again, makes the hair stand back up on the back of my neck. He began to figure out that species are related, that they've come from common ancestors, and that there is this constant change through transmissible information that is acted upon by natural selection. And in modern day science, we, we view these phylogenetic trees not only by looking at homology at the morphological level, such as a hand versus a bat wing, for example, but we can now look at this newer level in terms of genome sequence. And, and taking all of that type of data together, we can begin to construct an idea of how organisms are related and, and the distance amongst them. And so when we start to think about that with respect to circadian clocks, we find that you find 24-hour rhythms, for example, in photosynthetic bacteria called cyanobacteria. Why would you care about that? Because cyanobacteria in the oceans produce about 30% of the oxygen of this planet. We are tightly linked to the metabolism of these little photosynthetic bacteria that have these fantastic 24-hour clocks. They rise and they sink on a 24-hour rhythm. They adjust their ability to photosynthesize, to fix nitrogen, and to even try to frighten their neighbors away by flashing and glowing at, at their neighbors and, and presumably avoiding predation. So right here in, in the bacterial world, we know that clocks must have arisen quite early because of their presence in this particular band of the eubacteria, the cyanobacteria. In plants, we'll be talking about how clocks occur and, and uh, are conserved amongst all plant species in their structure. But what's very interesting is that the genes that we find that make up the plant clock seem to be absent in the clocks that we look at in animals and in fungi. And so it raises a, a, a controversy for the field that's not entirely resolved, which is the possibility that biological clocks are so important that they confer, they confer such a strong adaptive advantage on the organisms that they potentially have arisen multiple times throughout evolution. So again, by comparing organisms in groups, understanding how those organisms function in groups, and then looking at the differences of the mechanisms between different taxonomic groups, we can rationalize how complex biological processes have come to be present in the world as we know it today. Now in La Jolla or San Diego, you can see biological rhythms at certain times of the year. How many people have seen the ocean glowing at Torrey Pine State Beach? It, uh, it glows at certain times of the year when there are blooms of dinoflagellates, 
And it has two modes of bioluminescence. The flash that occurs from the surf curling over that sets off the luminescence. But these organisms also have a longer term 24 hour rhythm in bioluminescence which actually nobody really knows why they have it. Nobody knows why they have this 24 hour glow pattern. And the other instance in which in San Diego you'll come across biological rhythms is that butterflies, particularly things like uh, painted lady and the monarch butterflies, are incredible navigators. Just as in Darva Sobel's book where um, medieval mariners needed to use an accurate clock so they knew when noon was and when the sun should be overhead. That is exactly what butterflies use in migration. They use the, the ability to look at the position of sun relative to internal clock markers that they produce from their circadian rhythms and they navigate using a solar clock. And in April here in Southern California, they'll migrate out of Baja California and the Arizona deserts and sadly will often smatter across your windscreen as you're driving up I-5. But this is, is examples of how clocks are right here on our doorsteps in nature. How are clocks constructed? So now we have to start going to a little bit of detail and thinking, how would we build a clock? How have clocks evolved? What are their components? And we tend to think of clocks as being built out of three major domains, okay? Obviously a central oscillator or timekeeping mechanism, which would be akin to the cogs inside of a, an old clock or watch that you might have. That oscillator mechanism needs to control lots of biology. This would be the hands of the clock or what we would call the output of the system. And of course our clocks are only relevant if the hands of the clock can be bumped a little bit each day because of this change that occurs in, in day length throughout the year. So because of this change in day length, the hands of our clock need to be bumped and adjusted a little bit each day. And so there must be input pathways into this oscillator. Now in humans, you know about your sleep-wake cycle, right? How many of you have ever felt jet-lagged at some point? I know we as scientists, it, it's basically our profession to be jet-lagged. We, we travel around giving a lot of talks and we're often stumbling around at scientific meetings forgetting each other's names because we're so jet-lagged. But what you might be surprised to find out is an enormous amount of human physiology is clock-regulated. So if you measure, for example, your core body temperature, your core body temperature begins to rise in the morning prior to you awakening, essentially preparing yourself for an upswing in your metabolic rate as, as you arouse from sleep and prepare for activity in, uh, during the day. So we have a, a very pronounced rhythm in our core body temperature. Lots of measures of cardiovascular function are clock regulated. We'll touch on that a little bit later and explain why that's important. And also lung function. So of course, I think many of us are familiar with asthmatics and, and, and the fact that many types of, of asthmatics have asthmatic tacks in the middle of the night. And this is to do with circadian rhythms in the responsiveness of your airways to certain chemical signals, inflammatory signals in your airways. And finally, we, we know from recent studies that, that energy metabolism and glucose tolerance, there seems to be a close link between um, the mechanisms for glucose homeostasis and fat metabolism and our ability to have a sound circadian clock. These rhythms literally are everywhere. If you take a, a, a human subject and put an actometer on their wrist, you can measure human sleep-wake activity by measuring the amount of activity that the patient generates from moving their wrist and you'll see it produces these, these beautiful 24-hour rhythms um, in activity. So these, this, this type of, of human activity was used to study how clocks are organized in humans. And so here you can see a classical experiment where a human subject and, and the turquoise bars here are activity and the yellow bars are sleep, they're put into an isolation chamber where they're no longer exposed to light dark cycles. And what happens now is the hands of their clock aren't being bumped anymore and their clock starts to run at its natural pace.
and your, the natural pace of your clock is never exactly 24 hours. And so in this patient, when they go into isolation, this subject, they start their day later and later and later each day until they're brought out of isolation and back into a light, light dark cycle and then their clock becomes, as we say, entrained. So our clocks can run on their own. They can generate an oscillation on their own. But to be relevant to us in the real world, they're entrained by things like the light-dark cycle. Now, sleep-wake cycles, of course, are, 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 are well known as are disorders of the sleep-wake cycle. And there's basically two types of disorders of the sleep-wake cycle. Extrinsic, so jet lag and shift work sleep disorder, are, are really quite serious syndromes. They result in billions of dollars a year um, in, in lost income. And there's a great interest, of course, in, in treatments for jet lag and in treatments for, for shift workers. There's some very large meta-analysis going on that's really looking at health in, in shift workers. And I think some of the, the more trustworthy emerging data is saying that there appears to be certainly links between metabolic syndrome and shift work. Um, so this is going to be something that, that I think is emerging in medicine and, and the whole idea of chronotherapy and helping people recovering from shift work and recovering from jet lag to organize their circadian lives. And there are also intrinsic sleep disorders, ones I'm afraid that we're born with. And what we'll hear a little bit later is, is that work in the fruit fly and work in the laboratory mouse identified genes that later on were shown in human populations to cause terrible types of sleep disorders. I don't know about you, but I personally really can't stand having my uh, sleep disrupted. Um, but there are some people who were born with serious genetic disruptions of their sleep, and we've been able to rationalize clinically those disruptions because of work that's been done in fruit flies and in mice, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. Of course, it's hard to mention circadian rhythms and jet lag without mentioning baseball. And I personally am a fan of, of the Padres and the work that, that Mr. Moores and, and his team does. But, but this is something that the Padres are up against. This was a paper that was published in the prestigious journal Nature that looked at home team victory percentage when teams travel. And so what you have to look at is when teams travel from the west to the east, in which case the home team is the east, the home team has about a 62.3% uh, victory percentage versus 56.2% when the travel is from east to west. So that gives you a clue, perhaps, about teams from the west coast and the type of winning percentage they're going to have when they travel to the east coast. It is much harder to reset your clock when you fly eastwards than it is when you fly westwards. And why is that? Well. Our clock is light sensitive. We have a network of cells in our retina that are separate from our visual photoreceptors that receive light signals and project directly to a small portion of the brain that we call the suprachiasmatic nucleus. This region of the brain lies in the hypothalamus and contains two nodes of 10,000 neurons. These 10,000 neurons are rhythmically active. They fire in concert, and they fire in a 24-hour rhythm. And so what we want to understand is, is how do these cells um, mount this 24-hour activity pattern? What's inside of these cells that's driving their 24-hour activity? Because it's those cells that are driving our sleep-wake cycle. Jet lag is not the only circadian disorder, though. As I mentioned, um, there are lots of circadian rhythms in hemodynamic parameters, blood clotting, blood pressure, um, this, uh, different types of vasodilation. And wh what that results in clinically is the observation that a lot of catastrophic cardiac events, such as myocardial infarctions, myocardial ischemia, and hemorrhagic stroke, actually have a circadian pattern to them in terms of the time of onset. And this perhaps could provide a key to types of chronotherapy that might improve outcomes for people who are at high risk for cardiovascular disorders. This is a, an, an emerging field where taking into account the timing of biological events may become important in the clinic. What I also want to point out, point out from what we've heard then is that there are lots of readouts for rhythms. 
which means one of two things. It means the clock that I described to you in the brain is driving these rhythms in, in peripheral tissues because the only way that light signals get to our clocks in humans is through our eyes and to the center in the brain. So perhaps the brain clock just simply drives rhythms in the periphery. The alternative view, of course, is that the peripheral cells each have their own clock, but like an orchestra, listen to a conductor from the brain. As we go on in the talk, we're going to be looking at how we differentiate between those two possibilities. Does the brain drive these rhythms? Or indeed, are there individual oscillators in these cells that in some way are, are conducted by the clock that's present in the brain? So the questions that, that myself and my lab and my colleagues ask every day are, how are biological clocks built? Which tissues and cells have clocks? Which genes encode the molecular cogs? And how many clocks are there? How many types of clocks are there in an organism or indeed amongst different types of organisms? How do we distinguish between the cogs and the hands of the biological clock? Well, what we're talking about here, of course, is the relationship between genotype, the genetic makeup, the genetic information that we have encoded in our DNA and chromosomes, and how our genotype ultimately affects the structure and activity of our cells and tissues, which ultimately, of course, affect the morphology and behavior of humans. How do we relate genotype to phenotype to figure out molecular mechanisms that underlie physiology? And one of the great tools that scientists use is genetics. And let me explain to you a little bit what genetics is and why. Imagine a, a geneticist. She's very clever. She's spent her whole life doing genetics. And she has a friend who's a biochemist. He also thinks that he's very clever. And what they want to do, imagine they've never before seen a car factory. And they look at this car factory, and every day they watch workers go in. It's clear that one of them is a boss, and some of them are regular workers, and every day cars come out. The biochemist's approach is to throw on a, 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 a visor, get a huge blowtorch, melt down the car, sweat away all day, and come up. Basically, the, the answer is that this car is made up of a certain percent of glass, plastic, rubber, and metal. But what, that what the biochemical approach has a problem with is understanding exactly how the car is assembled and how the car works. They know the composition, but they don't know how it works. The geneticist, she's much more laid back. She sips a drink, she sits in her chair, and what she does after watching the biochemist sweat like this all day is simply walk down the hill and tie the hands of one of the car workers. And what happens is, is the cars come out without wheels on. The geneticist, she turns around to the biochemist and says, you know what I learned today? She takes a sip of her drink. I learned that this person is responsible for putting the wheels on the car, and without wheels, the car can't run. The biochemist looks concerned. The next day, and what he does is he goes and buys a bigger blowtorch. The next day, the geneticist strolls down the hill, ties the hands of another worker, and now the cars come out white, albino, no paint. She says to him, what I learned today was this guy is responsible for putting paint on the car, but the car can still work without any paint on. And of course, on the last day, she ties the hands of the boss, and the cars come out perfectly normal. <laughs> and her conclusion is, is that in any system, there's redundant components. <laughs> this is what a geneticist does every day. They induce mutations in a genome, and then have a look at what happens when you induce those mutations, and that's how you figure out how things work. Of course you need the biochemist, because the biochemist provides the molecular details of how these things work. To do genetics, you have to go to a security council. And the genetic security council are what we call model organisms, and their presence in worms, plants, Arabidopsis, the mouse, bacteria and yeast, and of course the fruit fly. We use these model organisms for all kinds of good reasons because they grow quickly, they're often cheap to grow, they have rapid life cycles, and they're very fertile. And, and that all of those things make them great for doing genetics. Some of the other tools we use are genomics. And that is the idea that, of course, every cell pretty much in our body has the same genetic makeup, but our cells look different. They behave different. And the reason is, of course, is that DNA kind of likes to express itself. 
And in each one of these cells, it expresses itself differently. So that for, it, it really creates this field that we call functional genomics, or at this time of year, what I like to call Nordstromics, which is really talking about shopping for gene function. How do we define which genes, for example, are involved in brain function, liver function, or heart function? So through a combination of genetics, that is inducing mutations and looking at how things behave, and genomics, which an example of is looking at when and where genes are expressed, scientists can wield these tools now to begin to find out how things work. And what we found out from clocks in all organisms, and so this is what's truly related about clocks across all organisms, is they have the same architecture. And that is, clocks are composed of genetic regulatory loops where positive components, this is a protein, switches on a gene. The gene is turned into a protein which then switches off its own expression. This is a negative feedback loop that can generate an oscillation. And this is true in those tiny little cyanobacteria. It's true in fungi, it's true in plants, it's true in insects, it's true in mammals. This is the basic way in which oscillators have been built in vivo. And importantly, of course, light signals have to be brought into these oscillators so that our clocks can be trained in many organisms by light through the light-dark cycle, but also in a lot of organisms, clocks are entrained by temperature. So there's a great story to be told, and I, I can't do it justice tonight, but there's a gentleman sitting at the front here who can tell you a lot more about this story, Ralph Greenspan. And it's a story of, of, of fruit fly genetics and clocks, because it was in fruit flies where this incredibly courageous graduate student, Ron Konopka, used the fact that fruit flies emerge, the adults emerge from the larval cases at morning, presumably so they can dry their wings out before the sun comes up and fly away from whoever eats fruit flies. And they used that as a genetic screen, Konopka and Benza, to identify the first clock mutants. And they called one of those first clock mutants the period gene. They got flies that lost their circadian rhythms. And in fact, this whole story is written up in a beautiful book called Time, Love, and Memory by Jonathan Weiner, who can do a much better job at telling you about the impact of Drosophila genetics, not only in circadian rhythms, but also in memory formation. And Jonathan, interestingly, authored another fantastic book called The Beak of the Finch. It's a great story of how the fruit fly led the way. And what did we find from the fruit fly? Exactly what I told you before, which is clocks are made up of these genetic regulatory loops. And so the gene period um, is, is, is expressed in flies at night. It forms a partnership with another gene called timeless as a protein. And these two proteins go back into the nucleus and switch off the action of two other genes called cycle and clock. And that is basically how molecular oscillators are built in the fly. And interestingly, flies use a protein called cryptochrome that was first discovered in plants. But there appears to be cryptochromes in all kingdoms, uh, another way in which evolutionary relationships can help us figure out how things work. And it's this blue light photoreceptor that helps entrain the fly clock. Now, of course, the mouse is another great member of the Genetic Security Council. And one of the reasons is mice have been used so much in circadian research is the running wheel. I think many of you have seen mice or hamsters running in running wheels. You might be interested to know that the average lab mice will run about five miles a night in a running wheel. And in fact, an old German scientist described to me how he was retiring and he brought all of his running wheels home and put them in his garage. And he heard this noise in the middle of the night. And I kid you not, he went out to his garage and they were absolutely full of wild mice running in these wheels. So we know it's something they love to do. It's TV for mice. <laughs> and the data, of course, is similar to the human data, except mice are nocturnal, so they run at night. And then when you take them out of a light-dark cycle, they drift. In this case, they're drifting earlier because their period is a little bit less than 24 hours. And this type of assay led people like Joe Takahashi and then a whole wealth of people in the field to identify the first clock mutants in mice. Using these genetic approaches, 
And again, these gene expression or genomic approaches, a whole wealth of people contributed to this emerging picture of clocks that came out uh, uh, around, 19, around 1999 through to about 2005, which was that many of the same proteins that are used to form the clock in the fly are used to form the clock in mammals with some elaborations. And so on this movie, we're going to take a look at how the molecular clock ticks inside of a mammalian cell. And we're going to be interested in, in really just four genes. The mouse version of period looks very similar sequence-wise to the Drosophila version. The protein cryptochrome, and these genes are expressed at night. And what happens is their mRNA is produced at night. They produce proteins. These proteins go back into the nucleus by sticking to each other. And the PER and the CRY proteins start to accumulate in the middle of the night. As they accumulate into the middle of the night, they start to interact physically, protein sociology, by sticking to the two proteins that switch on the PER and CRY genes. When they stick to those proteins, it's nighttime now, they switch the genes off. Now, PER and CRY are no longer being expressed, so their proteins eventually are degraded. When their proteins are degraded, they no longer repress their own expression. So what happens the next morning? The genes come back on again. This is a molecular oscillator. It's as accurate as anything that you carry on your wrist, as anything as you have on your mantelpiece at home. And this is essentially how we build 24-hour clocks inside of cells. Now, other tricks that we need in addition to, to the ones that I've described are how to visualize things inside of, of organisms. And so there's a family of protein called luciferases, and I've mentioned how luciferases are important in the ocean and how they're also, um, bioluminescence is present in many types of organisms. And the bioluminescence that I've been most interested over the years is in this great guy, the firefly. As you know, fireflies use bioluminescence, the females use it to attract mates. And in fact, there are cousins of, of fireflies that are competitors, and the female actually mimic the flashing pattern of her competitors, bring the males down and eat them instead of mating with them. Um, what we can do is we can take the gene out of fireflies and put it into different organisms to measure gene expression, this thing that I talked about how genes are switched on and off. So several of us in the field have done this, and we've taken that firefly gene and hooked it up to a clock gene and made glow-in-the-dark mice. And what we've discovered from these glow-in-the-dark mice is has solved this issue that I was talking about. What we found out is, is that every single tissue in the mammalian body has its own clock. And you can isolate these tissues from the animal and culture them, and they will exhibit their own rhythms. You can even take individual neurons from that region of the brain, the SCN, that's the clock that controls your 24-hour activity, and you can put them into culture, as, as, as Dave Welsh has done here in our lab, and you can measure in real time transcription occurring on a daily basis inside of these cultured cells. And what's really amazing um, that you can, could see from this movie is all of those individual cells, when they're cultured, are cycling differently from all the other ones. So there must be something in vivo that collects these cells together and makes a concerted rhythm that controls our sleep-wake cycle. If we dissociate these cells, their little clocks all run happily along individually, but in the living organism, they must be built together into a tissue that actually beats out a pacemaker for life. And what we've learned from these types of experiments using luciferase is lots of individual tissues have their own clocks and they receive orchestrating or entraining signals from the pacemaker that's inside the SCN. The SCN is a master pacemaker for receiving light signals. Like I said, they receive those signals from the retina and they entrain the rest of, of the oscillators in, in, in the organism. So the story now, in 2007, is now much more complicated. And don't worry about the gene names. Just think about this. We've learned recently that clocks are not made up of one feedback loop. They're made up of multiple feedback loops. These feedback loops mesh with each other in the same way that 
wheels of, of gears mess with each other, and this elaborated architecture appears to make a much stronger, a much more robust clock than one single loop can. And what we've learned from science is that this architecture again is conserved evolutionary between mammals and flies, even though some of the different proteins are used. So that's a view inside of animals' clocks. In the last um, part of the talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about plants because clocks are incredibly important in terms of understanding plant biology. And of course, part of this is because plants are nailed to the floor. They can't move around. They have to coordinate with the environment. And one of my prized possessions is, is this. It's the first American edition of a book that was published by Darwin near the end of his life. And this book in 1880 is called The Power of Movement in Plants. And Darwin was fascinated by 24-hour rhythm in plants, and he invented all kinds of mechanisms for measuring them. He smoked glass cylinders that would rotate slowly, and he glued pins onto the ends of plants, and the pin would scratch a 24-hour rhythm into the rotating glass disc, and that's how he measured some of the first rhythms um, in plants. Plants are not still life. Every time you go to an art gallery and you see a great Dutch still life by masters, Think about what you see in time-lapse photography. Plants leap, jump, curl, move. They do a lot. They just do it in a different time scale to us. And pretty much almost all plants exhibit 24-hour rhythms in the positions of their leaves. And again, as, as biologists, we're not exactly sure what advantage they get from it. It's clear in some species of plants it's, it's, it's to do with water relations and water control. But clocks again are everywhere in plants. Carolus Linnaeus, the, the, um, the Scandinavian biologist, in 1751 proposed planting a garden based on the opening and closing of flowers. And what he suggested was that because flowers open at different times of the day, you'd be able to plant a garden using species that opened at different times of the day and know what time it was. Unfortunately, it only took a few Swedish winters to actually make this rather a difficult proposition. But today, using easier to find plants and, and teaching tools have been developed around this, you can actually pick plants such as goat's beard that opens by noon or closes by six, evening primrose which opens at 6 a.m. and noon, scarlet pimpernel, etc., that could actually give you a, a flower clock in your garden. Another reason why plants open and close their petals is that they produce in a rhythmic way chemicals that attract pollinating insects. So plants have these incredible chemical factories that in a rhythmic basis produce sweet smelling chemicals that attract insects to them. So tobacco plants, we're not keen on tobacco plants except as experimental subjects, tobacco plants produce this chemical at night because they're pollinated by nocturnal insects or hawk moss. Snapdragons produce the same chemical but produce it in the morning because they're pollinated by bees. So there's a coevolution that occurs between the circadian rhythm that's driving the behavior of the insect and the clock that's inside of the plant cells that is not only opening and closing its petals, but is also driving the synthesis rhythmically of sweet smelling compounds. Darwin was very interested in this coevolution, and he, not so much from a temporal point of view, but a spatial point of view, and he noted that in columbine flowers that have very long tubes, there will be pollinating insects that have to have equally long proboscises. And this, in fact, used to be known as Darwin's hawk moth because he actually predicted the existence of this moth that would have a sufficiently long proboscis to reach into those flowers before it was ever found. And of course, some of these moths, like the hummingbird hawk moth, are actually diurnal. And on occasion, in, in temperate climates, you'll see these guys flying around during the day because the circadian rhythm in their brain is co-evolving with a totally different clock in the plant that's producing the attractants. But it's hard to work on columbines in the lab. And so we have our own botanical drosophila. We call it a Rabidopsis. It's small. Look at its seeds compared to a penny. One plant could be cupped in my hand, and it's a fantastic genetic organism. 
So people in my lab and I took the firefly gene, we put it into Arabidopsis plants, and now these plants glow with rhythmic bioluminescence thanks to a little bit of genetic engineering. We can use this bioluminescence pattern that we can see in these plants to identify clock mutants. So just as I described to you in flies and mammals, we can create glow-in-the-dark plants, and when we tweak their genome a little bit, we can create mutants where the clock isn't running properly. The product of that type of research is, again, we can isolate the clock genes in plants and identify what they are and where they work. And the amazing story here is the genes look very different from the ones that we found in the animal kingdom, but they work in the same way. And so again in plants, we initially found these single gene regulatory feedback loops, and more modern research has now shown, in fact, that plants have exactly the same thing that we found in mammals and flies. They have these multiple feedback loops that interlock with each other, and the advantage of this Olympic ring of regulatory loops is it makes the clock much more robust. It makes the clock more accurate. It gives the clock the ability to control more processes in more tissues. So the architecture of the system makes perfect sense, but the problem has been solved throughout evolution of the plant kingdom using different proteins from what we found during the evolution of the animal kingdom. Clocks are phenomenally important in plants. They control all kinds of processes. And one that we become really interested in is, is that almost all plants grow rhythmically. For any of you who grew in the south and are familiar with sorghum, sorghum grows at night, sometimes by almost a centimeter at night. And that's because the circadian rhythm of plants lays down cellulose each night and allows the plant to elongate. This cellulose then, in terms of a global perspective, billions of tons of the cellulose are laid down by the planet every night by plant species. And there's a great interest in this because what cellulose is, is long strings of sugar. And what people are really interested now is how can we unlock cellulosic sugars instead of using corn and sugarcane to actually produce bioethanol. This lignocellulosic production, which in fact is controlled rhythmically, is something of intense interest because if we can understand how plants grow rhythmically and lay down the cellulose rhythmically, it should open us for us ways in which we can um, exploit this for making better biofuels. The final thought I want to leave you with is that clocks are also fantastic seasonal timers. Have you ever noticed how chrysanthemums are blooming in the fall as the days are getting short? Lilies are blooming in the spring as days are getting long. This is a process called photoperiodism. And our clocks are used, our 24-hour clocks are used to measure the seasons. And what people in, in my laboratory have found out recently is this is exactly how it works. The plant clock is controlling the expression of two genes. You don't have to worry about their names. These two genes on a summer's day are expressed together at the same time on a summer's day in San Diego. The clock is controlling this pattern. Sunlight comes into play. These two proteins stick together. They switch on another gene, which in combination again with the presence of light, switch on a master gene called FT. Amazingly, this gene travels from the leaves of the plant to the head of the plant and causes flowering to occur. And so this is a way in which a 24-hour clock is used in a very elegant way to become a seasonal timer. Now, lots of animals also have seasonal reproduction, and so it's going to be of interest to see if they're also using their 24-hour clocks to control flowering. And to me, versus luciferase, flowering to me is one of the most amazing phenotypes that you can see in nature. So our clocks control a lot of physiology. They're, they're important for us to adapt to our environment, to be better adapted to our environment. In humans, it's not only issues with jet lag and, and shift work, it's also issues of cardiovascular disease or even cancer treatments where we're finding that 
the timing of a particular cancer treatment at a certain time of day can be more effective than at another time of day. Clocks are, are ubiquitous and are incredibly important in health and agriculture. I really have a number of people to thank tonight who sort of contributed towards this level of understanding that we developed about biological rhythms and putting it into an evolutionary context. The first, of course, are my lab members and people in the dean's office and the graphics team who helped this talk together. Some of the movies I've shown today were, gi were given by kind permission of Joe Takahashi of Howard Hughes. I'd again like to thank Amelin and, and Kieran for their support. For the Natural History Museum staff, this, this partnership that we have in, in terms of trying to get difficult science concepts across to you and, and how excited we are about exploring the biological world, I think is incredibly important. And to UCSD TV, who are, are going to enable us to transmit this type of info information broadly. We have our own website, evolutionmatters.ucsd.edu. You'll be able to go to this website and not only see past lectures in this series, when it was called the Grey Matter Lecture Series, but we'll be mounting our lectures too. Um, also, we'll be working with high school teachers to develop an educational um, curriculum along with some of this material. And if I might leave you with passing words from a great British theologian and epigrammatist, a 17th century Welshman, John Owen, who was a clergyman in Oxford, and what he told us were these wise words, tempora montanta nosit mutamor in illus, which of course means the times change and we change with them. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention tonight, and I really hope you feel you learned something new. <laughs>